Welcome to Gateway Austin's online campus. My name is Eric Bryant. I'm the campus pastor and I wanna welcome you. Whether you're part of the Gateway Church family here in the Austin area, or you've been part of our online campus, you live in Canada, California, or Kalamazoo, we're just so glad that you're here with us. And maybe you've heard about this from a friend or family member. You are in for a treat. We're getting to hear from our founding pastor, John Burke. He's the best-selling author of Imagine Heaven, and this series is all about his new book, Imagine the God of Heaven. You're going to be blown away by the stories that we hear from those who've had near-death experiences, and you will gain incredible insights as John Burke opens the scriptures to us in a way that helps us understand. So open your mind, open your heart, and let's dive in. I grew up in Council of Iowa in a Jewish family. My dad's an atheist, a hardcore atheist, and my mom's an agnostic. Despite my parents, I had always believed in God, always. It was spring and I was 16. My horse reared up, fell over backwards, and as she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I just left. I knew I was dead. There was a light over my shoulders and it was illuminating everything in front of me. As my Hindu belief, I thought if I die, then that should be it. Maybe I'll come back as another, another living thing in this life. But it did not happen. I heard code blue, code blue. I asked the doctors what, what actually happened. He said, well, they could not revive your heart. A bright light was appearing before me. I knew that light had superior authority, superior power. I knew it was a divine light. I fell in love with that light. I was born in Rwanda to the parents with the different ethnic backgrounds. One Otto, another one Tutsi, mixing with the Islam and the tradition uh, ancestry worship. I was diagnosed by blood cancer. The doctor said that uh, this cancer is on fourth stage and they cannot be here. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room, a bathroom in. His white garment was very shiny, shiny, that kind of sunshine pierced in my eyes. When all the COVID situation was happening and I was extremely sick, I just knew that I was gonna die. And I started floating on top of my husband's head and I'm looking at my body. I was just like, am I dead? And I started screaming, God, please forgive me. Cause I realized he was real in that moment. I knew that there was something missing. This light pops bold, like seeing the sun without burning. I knew that that was the voice of God because of the authority and the love. It was like, I am who created you. I just knew that I was made by this. Well, hey, it's so great to be back. Thank you. It's so awesome to be back speaking uh, to all our campuses today. And I've missed you guys. I've, I've been so excited, so pleased with Carlos and, and our team and how they've been leading us. And, um, but I've missed you guys. And, uh, but uh, I, I mean, I've been here, actually. Uh, I'm just a normal person now. It's kind of nice. <laughs> kind of nice to be a normal person. My, my wife and I, Kathy, and I uh, come meet our kids and uh, we come to church, you know, we hang out and see all our friends, and then we sit right over there, come in late. I learned well from you guys, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't endorse that still, but it is hard when you're talking to everybody. But I am so excited to be back to share with you the research I've been doing over the last three years and why God led me to pass the baton and really move into writing again. Because all over the globe, like these people I interviewed that you're going to hear from today, when people's heart stops, when their brain waves cease, and yet modern medicine or miracle brings them back, they commonly say they were in a world more real than this world. 
and they experience things more real than what they've experienced here. And all over the globe, they see the same God of light who consistently they say this God is love and what matters most to this God is how we love and treat one another. So who is this God? And what is God really like? That's what we're gonna start exploring today. And then over the next three weeks, we're gonna continue. You can join me online at 1 p.m. at Gateway's online campus, live.gatewaychurch.com. And we're gonna go deeper into what we're gonna touch on today. But before we dive into that, let me address maybe some resistance that some of you might have. Like maybe some of you are thinking, this guy's weird. He talks to dead people. No, they're not dead when I talk to them. They've come back, okay? <laughs> and, and honestly, it's, it's more normal than you would ever believe. Do you know that in 2019, the European Academy of Neuroscience did a study. They reported across 35 countries, and they found that 5% or one out of 20 people, when they clinically die, have had a near-death experience. That's millions of people that have had one of these NDEs. And I believe that this is God giving global evidence of his love and grace offered to all the nations in our age of global connection around the world. All right, well, but how do you know that this these NDEs are not just hallucination or, you know, in, endorphins in the brain, anesthesia, anoxia, or just a trick of the brain, like Dr. Michael Shermer says. Well, when I started studying these, I was still a skeptical analytical engineer. My dad had died of cancer and someone had given him the very first book that recorded this research. I read it in one night and I said, oh my gosh, could this be evidence? And that led me on a journey where I came to faith in Jesus. And for 35 years, I've studied thousands of these accounts. And in 2015, for those of you who don't know or don't know me, I wrote a book called Imagine Heaven that shows that the, the heaven and hell, the afterlife that people experience in these near-death experiences is exactly what the scriptures talk about. And eight years later now, I've written the book Imagine the God of Heaven because of all the beauty that Indy Ears spoke of, of all the loving reunions with family members, all the wonders of heaven, they would consistently say nothing at all could compare to just being in the presence of God. That God is actually the love you have always wanted. That's what they've consistently said. And so this new book is about God. And in chapter two, I, I go through the 10 points of evidence that convinced me as a skeptic and many medical doctors why this can't be hallucination or anesthesia or anoxia or just a trick of the brain. But the new book is really about God's identity proven through history and God's great love story, his heart and character and mystery and, and majesty explained through the scriptures, but illustrated through 70 people from every continent that I've interviewed, just like the ones you're gonna hear from today. But here's a question. Has God just started revealing himself in the age of near-death experience? No. And, and what we find is that the Bible is actually God's love story. If you read it cover to cover, God created all nations for relationship with himself. And yet all people have at some point rejected that relationship. And yet from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 12, he raises up two people to form a nation. And here's what he says. I will make you into a great nation, he says to Abraham and Sarah, and I will bless you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And the Jewish nation was raised up so that God could not only preserve his words in the scriptures and give proof of his identity, which I show through the book, but also foretell this Messiah to come who would be the savior for the nations, right? That he would offer his life that anyone who wants to come home to God can. And in the very last book of the Bible, John reports seeing in heaven, in his vision of heaven, a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language there before the throne and before the lamb, Jesus. And then the Bible ends with a great wedding. <laughs> it's bizarre, it's mysterious, but it's God's great love story. 
And if you miss that, you miss so much of what God is actually doing in this world. And you know, he is mysterious. And one of the things he says is you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And through these NDE testimonies, God is confirming his words to the world today. Watch. My dad had a mantra. There is no God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. My heart hit my chest. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I realized there was a person standing right there. And he moved forward, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and it's like, oh, Jesus. I was not thinking, what is a nice Jewish girl like me seeing Jesus? No, I knew this man. I saw him from the time I was formed in my mother's womb, he had been with me. You know, just when I used to talk to God at night when I was a little kid, he'd been there. He'd been there sitting by my bed. I saw that. I can't explain how God can be a light, and God can be a man, and God can be love, I, I can't explain it. I can't, but that's what I experienced. They even called me, Karina, come, come. They were celebrating me. I'm like, me? Out of everybody? And I kept saying, God, I don't deserve you. I'm filthy. Send me back to hell. I knew I was going there, and he said, come, I love you. I knew I was home, that is home. When I died, I found myself in a very big, in a very big room. A person entered, wearing a, 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 a white garment with the standards, you know, holding his hand, you know, showing them to me with the very, these very big holes into his heart. He told me, I died for me. You are among those I died for. Never deny it again and tell this to everyone. I woke up, people, had come for body. So I started shouting, Jesus is in, in front of you. I'm seeing him. He is there. He's the one who has brought me back. I fell in love with that light because it was protecting me f from any harm, taking me somewhere safer. The light stopped and I saw that light was shining on top of a beautiful compound. Inside that compound or complex, I should say, is there's a lot of mansions, big buildings, absolutely gorgeous, square-shaped. It is very high walls, and I saw there's 12 magnificent gates there, beautiful gates, many angels there. They're protecting that gate. I knew I was looking at the kingdom of heaven. I saw there was a huge throne and on that throne, there was the Almighty. I knew he was the Almighty. I knew it automatically. His eyes were like lightning bolts. And all the sins I committed in my life was flushed before my eyes. So I kept repeating the same thing. That Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And then finally, he spoke to me. He's voice was full of tenderness, mercy, and the grace. He said, I'm sending you back to the earth. When the Lord spoke to me, I experienced the love, tenderness from him that I did not expect. Just a few short distance from him on the on that platform level, I saw a very narrow door or a narrow gate that was open. And that is the only gate through whom I can enter into the kingdom of heaven. I asked the Lord, Lord, when you see me again, please tell me how I can go through this narrow door. This next time when you see me, Lord, I want to go to the narrow door. Wild, right? How do you explain this? How do you explain why, why a 16-year-old Jewish girl who grew up hearing that Jesus was a hoax would see Jesus when she clinically dies and know that this was the God she had prayed to her whole life? And why would a Muslim imam in Rwanda come back from death saying that Jesus had saved him? 
and then become an Anglican priest who uh, has had six attempts on his life, still living in Rwanda, because he won't shut up about Jesus. And how do you explain why a Hindu manufacturing engineer describes the same holy city of God that John describes in Revelation 21 when he says he was taken into heaven, where he says he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city. It shone with the glory of God. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. It was square and as wide as it was long. And Santosh comes back seeking this God that he didn't expect, but he was like, who was this God of mercy and love and, and, and grace? And he was praying daily to know him. And two years later, uh, a friend of his daughter's invited her to sing in a choir at a church. And Santosh and his wife go to hear his daughter sing. And as he walks in, he feels the presence of the same God of love. And here's what the message was on that day. Two passages, Matthew 7 you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. And John 10, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And Santosh went and started reading the Bible and he told me everything I experienced was in there. And he's a devoted follower of Jesus today. God brought, God brought me testimonies like this from all over the globe. In Tehran, Singapore, India, China, Africa, Australia, all over the globe, pe people are discovering what Peter discovered. In Acts chapter 10, where it says that God saw the heart of Cornelius, a Roman you know, a soldier who grew up in polytheism, but he was seeking God and prayed to God. And God sends Peter to tell him what Jesus had done for him. And Peter replies this. He says, I, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And this is the message of good news. And then Peter goes on to explain how Jesus died to pay for the sins of all people. And that he is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. And indie ears are testifying to this today, all over the globe. Now, this confuses some, some Christians who have said to me, well, does that mean everyone goes to heaven? Well, no, not at all. In fact, 23% of people who come forward talking about their near-death experience had hellish near-death experiences. And half the people you're seeing in the video today also saw the reality of hell as well as heaven. But this is a very important thing to understand. NDEs are not eternity. They, they know there's a border or boundary they cannot cross and still come back to earth. In other words, this is not their eternal destination. They're just getting a peek. And they come back and they still can choose whether they will follow God or not. It's just like the Apostle Paul who wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. Remember when he was Saul? In Acts chapter 9, the same God of light appears to him on the Damascus road while he's going to arrest and kill Christians because he didn't believe in Jesus. And yet this God of light appears and he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Now notice, Jesus does not tell him the gospel. He doesn't tell him what to do. He later sends Ananias to explain it to Paul, and Paul still has a choice. Will he choose to follow Jesus? And that's true of these NDEs as well. These NDEs are more like if I went and visited Buckingham Palace and I got to see the palace, that doesn't mean the royal family is ready to adopt me into their family for me to move in forever, right? And that's what these NDEs are like. They're just showing us the truth of what's to come. And God wants all people to come back and seek him, and then they find him. You know, the truth is God doesn't tell people, even in their NDEs, because he won't force our will, because love is God's motive for everything. And I go into this in the book, but it's very important because love can't be forced. It can't be bought. It can't be coerced. And so God waits for our willingness. Will we seek him? 
And if we will, we'll find him. But what is this God like? Well, you know, many of us who who know Jesus think we know what God's like. But I want to challenge you because the truth is we all put God in a box. We have to. We're finite. And so I want to challenge you to expand that box as we go through this series. Because God is far more mysterious and majestic, more glorious and holy, more sovereign and all-powerful than you've ever imagined. But God is also far more relatable and personal and fun and even funny than you've ever imagined. And I hope you'll expand your box because it's what the scriptures teach, but it's also what these indie ears remind us of. God wants intimate, honest relationship with you. And the more you realize how God feels about you, no matter how you felt about God, the more you'll be willing to trust him. Watch what they learned. And I asked the Lord, Lord, please tell me what I need to do to enter. When you see me next time, I want to enter. To the... He said, I want to see how honest, how true, how sincere you are with me. 365 days a year, not just once a week. I want to see your relationship with me. What's your relationship? Once you are back to your family, I want you to love your family and love your children. The wages of sin is death. Commit no more sins. Surrender yourself completely should underline completely unto me in your daily lives. Walk with me. After this life review, he took my hand and we flew. We surfed. It was like we had this wave of light under our feet and we were holding hands and flying like Superman and Lois Lane. So faster and faster and faster. And he was grinning from ear to ear. And it was the most fun thing I have ever done in my life. I saw a light. And it was getting closer and closer and it was, it's a living light. And it's the brightest thing you can imagine, but I could look at it. It's perfect. It's blemishless, infinite in its scope. And that light was love. And Jesus took me directly into the light. And the next thing I knew, I find, found myself sitting on God's lap. And I have a granddaughter, a two-year-old granddaughter. And you know, if she needs comforting, she'll sit on my lap and bury her her face in my chest and I'll put my arms around her and she'll, she'll have her arms around me. That's what I was doing. I was like a little kid and I buried my face against his chest. And I put my arms around him and he had his arms around me and I never, ever wanted to leave. And everything in my body started shutting down. We have the documentation and the timing that my heart and my lungs, I was considered clinically dead for an hour and 45 minutes. And I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I found myself leaving my body and going toward this light. And I knew that's where Jesus and the Father is. And I wanted to be with them. And when I first came in, I remember there was a forest right before me. And when I got on the other side of the forest, that's when I saw Jesus Christ. He was real bright brighter than any light I've ever seen, even the sun. And probably what amazed me is I could look at him. And I went down on my hands and knees. And I said these words, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Only reason I was there is because of what he had done. Somebody always said, well, did you see the nail prints? I said, I saw them, but that's not what I was concentrating on. What I was concentrating on is the love that everything was coming out of him for me, like I was the only one he loved. Anybody I thought of in the, in the switch of my thinking, all of a sudden I saw the love for them like he only loved them. And I came to understand that God Almighty goes out and creates love for us that only we can receive. And that's what I was receiving, that love that God had made for me. Now that light come, coming off of him, I remember it wrapping itself around me. Someone asked me one time, was he hugging you? I said, everything about him was hugging me. How do you imagine God? Do do you realize that he's far more personal and relatable and involved with you than probably you've ever imagined? And he's even fun. Maybe you don't imagine God that way. You know, I think so many of us don't wholeheartedly trust God because deep down inside we think he's a party pooper. 
right? He's going to kill my fun. He's going to ruin my fun. He's up there, you know, looking down like, anybody having fun down there yet? Well, cut it out. Get back to work. And that's the way many of you imagine him. And if you imagine God like that, you got to get him out of that box. Because God is the most understandable, relatable, joyful being in the universe. Think about this. Have you ever loved or enjoyed anything on this planet? Have you ever considered that you wouldn't love or enjoy it if God hadn't created you with the ability to love it and enjoy it? And he understands everything we go through. You know, that's what Jesus came to show us. Jesus understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we did, yet he's without sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Just like Santosh and Swadik realized, not only can God relate, God is kind and, and merciful and he's ready to help. There's nothing too small or too large for you to ask him. That's God. He's there for you. You know, people will say things like, there are 8 billion people on this planet. God doesn't have time for my little, you know, petty things. Or, or how could God possibly hear the prayers of billions of people at the same time? And in the part of the book on God's mystery and majesty, it's going to stretch your imagination. Because God is far greater and more mysterious than you've ever conceived of. God is imminent, theologians say, say which, which means he is always everywhere. You know, it says this in Ephesians 4, there is one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. See, God is the very life force in every single person keeping us alive. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. He's infinite and he's everywhere and we can't even comprehend this God because he's also over all. He's transcendent. He's beyond the universe he created. And you know, all these big words you read about uh, in the Bible, God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, all he's omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, he's everywhere at once, holy, or as one NDE you'll hear describes as pure, eternal, infinite. All these are mysteries about God but as you hear from the words of these NDEs, you start to expand your understanding. Like this one uh, woman, Suzanne Seymour, who had an NDE when she was 12 years old. And she finds herself sitting by this tree with Jesus, who she said was just like a big brother or this just kind, wonderful, relatable dad. And then Jesus says to her, I'm much more than you see. And then she said, all those words in the Bible, like I just said, she said, they're all describing something, but all I could think of was, whoa, <laughs> just whoa. And when you hear them talk about the mystery of, of God, of this triune God, it blows your mind. You know, like for instance, Suzanne, you know, who was 12 when she had her NDE and Heidi, who was 16, both describe this one God, but as father, son, and spirit, yet these two girls had no prior understanding. Yet that's what they experienced. And I believe NDEs can help us actually expand our understanding of the mystery that God revealed through the Jewish prophets, starting you know, with Moses, that God is one. There's only one God. It says throughout the Bible, and yet God has mysteriously revealed himself as father, son, and spirit. Now, that sounds like a contradiction in our world because we're limited by three dimensions of space. And so three persons can't be one in our world. And so in the book, I put an analogy in. Uh, imagine if, if I created a flat two-dimensional world and I stuck three fingers into that world's plane of existence, kind of like, like this, Okay. And they don't even have a, an up or down, just side to side and front to back, okay? And so I would appear to them like three round circles, three flat circles like this. And yet what if I said to them, I'm not actually three round circles, I'm actually one being. But that'd be a contradiction because in a flat world, three flat round circles can never stack up 
my arm into one being because they don't even have an up. They don't have a third dimension. And so somehow by analogy, in God's extra dimensional world or beyond all dimensions, the Father, Son, and Spirit stack up as one being. And it's fascinating how near-death experiencers describe this. A funny little story when I, I was on this writing deadline and I needed this visual illustration. And, and so I, I, I called my son-in-law, Dom, because he's really good with computer graphics. And I said, hey, could you make me this hand illustration? And he sends this illustration back. And I thought it was a computer graphics. And then later I find out, no, that's his actual hand. He took a picture of his actual hand. <laughs> and uh, this book's going to be translated in multiple languages. So I told him, I said, well, hey, you know, if the high-tech sales thing doesn't work out, you've got experience now as an international hand model. <laughs> he likes to remind me, hey, I had a hand in that book. <laughs> Still does. <laughs> but Dr. Ron Smotherman, who's a neurologist and a psychiatrist, um, was actually attacked by a man having a, a psychotic break, stabbed 13 times. He showed me the scars where the knife went right through his neck. Miraculously, he survived. Right before the 14th blow to his heart, he said time stopped as this God of light appears. And listen as he talks about the, he and, and Dean Braxton talk about the mysterious qualities of this triune God. People always talk about a throne room. It wasn't a room like people think it is because to me, I was, it was more of um, being out in nature. I was there when we all gathered around the throne of God to tell our Father how much we love Him. This was not my belief system. I didn't even know it was in, in the Bible at the time, but He sung a love song back to us, each and every one of us. When I was talking to Him, I was talking to Jesus and also the Holy Spirit. It wasn't like they were all together, but they, you could not separate them in the sense of communication. The fullness of the Father is inside Jesus. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside of Jesus. The fullness of Jesus is inside the Father. The fullness of the Holy Spirit is inside the Father. He is one. You know, it's not one like we think is one. Some people say in the Trinity, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No one thinks that way there. They're just one. When God shows up in your face like a bomb blast, it really gets your attention. And I'm standing there in awe with a, with a knife aimed at me, by the way, and time stopped. All I know is that God showed up as a light and the light was roiling with energy, as you would expect if you were up close to, say, an, an atomic bomb. What was roiling even more was the love that came with it. It was, I'm sorry, I. I have a hard time talking about this. And in one single instant, all of his qualities were in my face. God's overarching quality is love. Everything is contained within that. His knowledge uh, came very suddenly as, as an image of a library filling the universe. His power was undisputable. The joy is it will make you happy for a lifetime. I can't think about it without getting full of joy. His authority is so great that um, you would follow any instruction. Kindness, um, you probably know someone who's, someone who's kind. If you can imagine that kindness magnified a thousand times. Humor is, is something rather surprising. You don't expect God to show up ready to, to, to laugh it off. Purity, he is so pure. It puts your own condition in stark relief. You can see that you're not that. And there's, and there's humility. If I had his qualities, I would be so proud, you know, but he's not. He is humble. Such humility. He's humble with those amazing qualities. But Jesus told us this. You know, he said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Any of you carry heavy burdens? 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle of heart. Do you imagine God as a, as a taskmaster, demanding, hard to please? Let him out of that box. It's not who he is. He's humble and gentle, and he wants to guide you and help you through life. And as Ron noted, even humorous, even fun to be with. Does that surprise you? Do you imagine God that way as, as someone who would be fun, even funny? You know, Greg Rickard and Heidi and others talked about how when God was showing them their life review, they often laughed together at funny things that happened in, in their life. Does it surprise you that God laughs or that God is joyful, that God is fun? You know, I'll be honest, when Heidi first told me that he, she and Jesus were surfing this wave of light faster and faster, I was like, hmm. <laughs> And I kind of took it and set it over on the shelf of my mind. And then I start hearing about this 14-year-old girl describing almost the same incredibly fun, wild journey with Jesus. And then a little child running and playing in the fields with Jesus. And I started to have to think, wait a second. Who do I think made up laughter and fun and enjoyment? Why do we think God is not the most joyful being in the universe? That's the wrong God. That's not the God of the Bible. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. And do you know that in the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to feast seven times a year, to have these big festivals. And on several of them, he said to the whole nation, celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. Jesus last night on earth, he said, stay connected to me. You know, walk with me and you'll bear much fruit. I have told you these things, he says, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And in the book, Indie Ears talk about how joy is your birthright in Christ. It's a joy not dependent on circumstances. It's only dependent on walking with him, staying connected, like Santosh said, daily, moment by moment. Have you imagined God as the one who wants to share a joy that you've longed for and that he actually enjoys doing life with you? And all it takes is just staying connected, which is prayer. And you know, pr prayer doesn't have to be this formal ritualistic thing. It's just honest, authentic communication with God. And I write about in, in the book how indie ears say in heaven, Prayers are, are, are a real thing that they actually see going straight to the heart of the Father and they see the Father answering and every prayer from the heart you've ever prayed, no matter how seemingly insignificant, is heard by God and recorded in heaven. And God is so good, he answers all of our desires. One day you'll see that all that you desired was met in him. You know, there's a Psalm, Psalm 37, four, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, so many people think if I follow God, I'm gonna miss out. You're not ever gonna miss out. And I used to think that, you know, this scripture was kind of metaphorical because of course we don't get everything we desire in this life, probably because it would destroy us. <laughs> but I found out talking to more and more indie ears, maybe in eternity, this is more literal than I ever thought. Jim Woodford discovered how good God is, even to those who don't deserve it. Jim is a commercial airline pilot. He had multiple uh, million dollar businesses. He owned a horse farm. Uh, he had a plane, a boat, 19 British sports cars, and none of that mattered the day he died. He had Guillaume Barre and got addicted to opioids and accidentally had an overdose in his truck. And as he's dying, right before his head hits the steering wheel, he cries out to God to forgive him. I joke with Jim that I think you beat the thief on the cross for last minute, buddy. <laughs> but listen, listen to how he describes the goodness of God who delights in delighting you. I knew I was dying, and I cried out, God, forgive me. 
In that nanosecond of death, I realized all that I had been given, all I had been blessed with, and I had never once thanked the Creator because I couldn't find proof of His existence. We talk about heaven is real, but so is hell. I cried out, God, help me, help me. I who should expect nothing because I gave him nothing, why should he help me? Because he's the God of never too late, if you are contrite. I look, John, and these three magnificent beings are coming toward me. Very tall, luminous creatures, beautiful in every way. First one, who I later found out had been my guardian angel since my birth, since my conception. The tall angel came forward and said, would you walk with us? We walked down this beautiful 10 to 12 foot wide path lined with flowers that, of colors that I'd never seen. And I think what happens is God, God knows us each so intimately, He tailors our experience to the, the life we had on earth. So for me, when we rise up, I'm looking down on the holy city. He gave me an aerial view of, of heaven, I suppose, because I was a pilot. We came back down and resumed the walking, and, and I've always loved horses. The guardian said, James, look, and then behind a group of trees came three of the most magnificent horses I'd ever seen. And as I'm standing there, I look up in the sky of heaven, and I see these brilliant streaks of light going straight up. And I said, what are these? And the guardian said, those, James, are the prayers of your family for your soul, even now going toward God's throne. The angel said, every prayer you've ever issued, ever thought, ever contemplated is recorded in heaven. And it's not to create an I gotcha moment. When you have your life review, when you cross through the veil and you have your life review, it's to help you understand why you made the decisions you did. But I realized I hadn't seen the tall angel in a while. And so I turned to look and the tall angel was, was bowing very low and he was facing this other tall commanding figure. It was as though this golden liquid light flowed down all sides of this magnificent figure. And the flowers that were already in bloom, when that golden light flowed over it, they bloomed again. And that light pooled around my feet, suddenly this knowledge of who I was looking at, and I'm looking none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, someone that I thought was just a Jewish legend. And here I am looking at this magnificent being. and. I realized then that he was re what the angel was holding up was the book of my life. And it's, it's no bigger than a cheap roadside diner menu. Mankind should have been my business. And I was just so self-consumed. And, and I was overwhelmed with sadness, shame. Jesus turned toward me. And he smiled at me. He smiled at me. When I looked into those eyes, and I saw such sadness for the way I had lived my life, but I also saw love for me and forgiveness. From that moment forward, whatever happened, I was His. When He smiled at me and I realized He loved me and I loved Him, it felt like I was the only one that He had ever created. You know, there was that instant connection and you'll all go through that. You are his child. You are his child. You are his child. He created you to walk with him, to know him, to love him, to trust him. And as you walk with him, to experience more and more of his joy in this life. And all he needs is your heart, your willingness. It's what the Bible calls your faith. Will you trust in him? And as Jim said, it's never too late to trust in him. Never. It's never too late to trust him more as well. Let's pray together. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for how you see us as your children and how you have loved us forever so much that you would send Jesus to die to pay for our sins so that nothing has to keep us away from you, except our pride, if we just say, I don't want you. And maybe you never realized that relationship with God is that simple. He's right here with you and he sees your heart. 
And if you want relationship with him and you've never told him, just tell him right now. God, I want your love. I want your forgiveness. I want what Jesus did to count for me. Come and lead my life. And God, thank you that that's all you need for us to be assured that we are right with you forever. And God, for those of us who know that, forgive us that we don't trust you more with every day of our lives. Help us to walk more closely with you day by day, trusting you more and more so that more of heaven's will and ways can come to earth through us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thanks so much. I hope that was helpful and meaningful to you. You know, if you're going through something, would you let us know? Our prayer team is here to pray for you. Just click the button, request prayer. If you're new to us, would you introduce yourself to us? You can simply do that at gatewaychurch.com slash connect. And to encourage you to do that, we have a gift we'd love to give to you. Some of you will get a copy of John's new book. Others of you might get an audiobook of Fruitful, Becoming the Person God Created You to Be. Or you might even get a Starbucks gift card. Just introduce yourself at gatewaychurch.com slash connect. There you can let us know if you want to join a group, if you want to jump in and serve with us, or even how we can be praying. We also want to make sure you know you can stay connected with us through our social media channels at YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. If you want to purchase a copy of John's new book, just go to imaginethegodofheaven.com and you can buy one for yourself or for your friends and family along the way. Finally, if this is your church family, thank you for your generosity. If you're a guest, feel no obligation to give, but you should know that those who are part of the Gateway Austin online church family give generously so that we can experience this together. Your giving is making a difference here in Austin and globally. If you'd like to join us in giving, simply do that by going to gatewaychurch.com slash give. So be sure and continue the journey with us at Gateway Austin Online.